Okay. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. I have a pleasure to welcome you uh, to our following seminar organized by our international research platform, Contested Legacies. Uh, today's lecture will be given by Professor Filippo Focardi from uh, University of uh, Padua. Uh, the title of his lecture is Political Transition and Memory Wars in Italy after the Crisis of the First Republic. But um, first of all, I'd like to introduce our today's uh, speaker. Uh, Filippo Cardi is full professor of contemporary history at the Department of Political Science, Law and International Studies at the University of Padua. Uh, his research interests focus on the memory of fascism and the Second World War in Italy, the question of punishing German and Italian war criminals, uh, the relations between Italy and German from 19th century to the present day, as well as the memory of Europe European Union. Uh, among his uh, several uh, publications, um, I'd like to uh, mention a monograph, which I had to, um, I had the pleasure to co-edit with uh, Filippo and with uh, Francesco Berti. Uh, the title is uh, Le Ombre del Passato. It's our book. Um, um, which was published uh, by Viella uh, Italian Publishing House um, um, in, 19, uh, in 2018, I think. And uh, this book is uh, dedicated to the memory of Holocaust in Italy and uh, in uh, Poland. Uh, with Filippo, we have organized uh, together uh, four conferences, international conferences de dedicated to the memory of totalitarianism, and memory of Holocaust, uh, nationalism uh, in um, historical and, and comparative uh, perspective, um, which were organized in Padua and in Krakow too. Um, today, uh, Filippo will be speaking to us about memory wars in Italy uh, after the collapse of the party system of the First uh, Republic and after uh, the coming to power um, of Silvio Berlusconi's uh, coalition government in 1994. Uh, indeed, uh, after uh, 1994, um, in Italy, uh, the right-wing forces, uh, especially Alianza Nazionale, but also Forza Italia, uh, started to criticize the memory of the resistance, the memory of uh, the resistance as an axis of um, political legitimacy of the Italian Republic. On the other hand, uh, they um, tried to promote a new um, historical narrative uh, based on um, anti-totalitarian paradigm uh, that equals the crimes of communism with the crimes of uh, fascism. Uh, I think that it's worth uh, emphasizing that right-wing forces um, have attempted to introduce new uh, commemorative dates, uh, such as the Day of Remembrance, which is uh, celebrated in February, 10th of uh, February, today, I think. Today, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. And uh, also uh, Freedom Day, uh, which is uh, celebrated on uh, November. Um, yes, today, today's commemorative day, Remembrance Day, um, was introduced in order to commemorate the Italian victims of uh, communist crimes, uh, especially Italian of Venezia Giulia victims of the violence of Tito uh, Yugoslav uh, communists. Um, in fact, uh, it's a very current issue. 
uh, we know uh, in Italy we uh, now have a centre-right coalition government led by Giorgia Meloni, who is the leader of uh, Brothers of Italy, uh, the party uh, which is considered by a large number of um, researchers of fascism as a post-fascist or neo-fascist uh, movement. And um, for example, I remember uh, in October, uh, the new um, president of Senate, um, Ignazio La Russa, who belongs to uh, Fratelli d'Italia party, uh, declared that he wasn't sure if he would uh, celebrate Liberation Day, 25 April. Uh, which is uh, anniversaries of, of uh, resistance and one of the most important uh, Italian public holiday. And I'm wondering if we are dealing now with um, public holidays war within uh, this ongoing memory war in Italy. But uh, now I give the floor to, to Filippo. Uh, after uh, the seminar, we are uh, dedicating 15, uh, 20 minutes for discussion, which will be coordinated by Professor Pożarlik. And now, uh, Filippo, please, <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Joanna, for your introduction. It's a really a pleasure for me to be here with you. And I apologize in advance for my English. <laughs> I'm not very used to speaking English. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I have prepared a, a text. I, I will read uh, uh, a text. Um, the dramatic political changes in Europe since 1989 with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the breakup of the Soviet Union and the disintegration of Soviet control over Central and Eastern Europe had a significant impact on Italy. These changes ushered in a phase of political transformation, which has since triggered a fierce struggle play out in the field of collective memory. Today, the reference points of this public memory have been radically modified with the crisis of the tradition of anti-fascism and the resistance and the rise of two new uh, narratives, the memory of the Holocaust and anti-totalitarianism that condemns the crimes of both Nazism and communism and places them on the same level. To evaluate the dynamic or, and the results of this process of change, we need to recall briefly the background to the creation of Italy's collective memory in the long earlier period from 1945 to 1989. At the end of the Second World War, Italy, like other European countries that had endured the Nazi aggression, had built a national collective memory based on two fundamental pillars. On the one hand, the almost exclusive attribution of guilt for the suffering and the crimes committed during the war to Germany and the Germans, playing down the country's own responsibility in the affairs of the Axis, and on the other, the exaltation of the myth of the Italian resistance as a struggle which engaged the entire population against the Nazi fascist oppressor. The merits of the good Italians were placed in stark contrast to the faults of the bad Germans, who in reality had been allies of the Italian fascists for three years. By the will of all the National Liberation Committee parties, from the liberals to the communists, who had led the struggle against Germany and the Republic of Salò, created by Mussolini in September 1943, uh, Anti-fascism and the resistance movement became icons of the new democratic republic and of the political multi-party system born after the fall of fascism. This collective memory, based on the acclamation of the merits of the Italian resistance and on the glossing over of Italian guilt for the war of aggression fought alongside Hitler, had suffered serious tensions during the years of the Cold War. 
The most important, perhaps, was the questioning of the democratic legitimacy of the Italian Communist Party, one of the protagonists of the resistance and one of the main signatories of the Constitutional Pact. For example, the Catholics and Liberals repeatedly accused the mm, Partito Comunista of being pawns of the communist totalitarianism led by Moscow. Nevertheless, the general framework of the national memory anchored in the resistance was never doubted. In fact, it was relaunched in the 70s as a common heritage encompassing all the democratic anti-fascist parties in the face of the dual challenge posed to the institutions of the Republic by the terrorism of the extreme left and extreme right. So the historical and moral heritage of the resistance was as a bulwark of the Republic against the challenge of the terrorism. The period of the so-called Second, uh, Second Cold War in the late 70s uh, at the beginning of 80s saw the reactivations in, it, in the Italian public debate of accusations against the communists for having monopolized the resistance. Uh, the unitary memory of the resistance was again challenged, not only this time by the conservative forces, but also by Craxist Socialist Party uh, that was in competition with the Communist Party. Now you see the, the leader uh, of the Italian Socialist Party, Bettino Craxi. The situation would change dramatically with the political upheavals of the early 90s. Since German unifications, Italy has prob probably been the Western European country most affected by the collapse of the Soviet Union and the disintegration of the international system of the Cold War. The transformation of the Communist Party in 1991 into a new political entity, the Democratic Left Party, Partito Democratico della Sinistra, was followed by a profound crisis of the entire system between 1992 and 1994, which imploded after the huge corruption scandal known as Tangentopoli brought to light and fought by the judiciary. Uh, you can also show the, the this one. Yes, you see the judges in the first line, uh, Di Pietro and the others as rock stars in an overcrowded uh, Milan. Therefore, in the early 90s, all the parties that had signed the constitutional Pact either found their influence severely reduced or disappeared completely. First, the Christian Democrats and the uh, Communist Party, marked by divisions and name changes. Then the Socialist Party, the Liberal Party, Partito Liberale, the Social Democrats, and the Republican Party. At the same time, new political movements with no roots in the anti fascist traditions gain prominence and some consensus. This was the case uh, of Umberto Bossi's Northern League and Silvio Berlusconi's Forza Italia. Um, ecco, you see the, the old Berlusconi, <laughs> per un nuovo miracolo italiano, for a new Italian miracle. Um, and of the whole the Italian uh, social movement, Movimento Sociale Italiano, the major Western European neo-fascist party now rebranded as Alianza Nazionale. Uh, and here you see the, the, the leader of the party, Gianfranco Fini. The MSA Alianza Nazionale was especially a party with historical and cultural roots diametrically opposed to the heritage of anti-fascism and the resistance was, uh, MSA was a neo-fascist party. Following a new electoral law in August 1993, the change from the proportional system centered on the old parties to a majority system that favored a bipolar arrangement with one pole dominated by forces alien or even opposed to anti-fascism 
triggered a fierce confrontation that was based on an unprecedented use of history for political purposes. One of the main factors behind the struggle for memory in the country was the need of the centre-right majority to legitimise Gianfranco Fini's uh, party as a force fit to sit in government after its electoral victory under Berlusconi in April 1949, uh, 19, uh, 94. Uh, with varying degrees of conviction, all the parties in the governing coalition converge on a course of action aimed at neutralizing anti-fascism as a factor of political legitimization and replacing it with anti-totalitarianism as the new point of reference. Anti-fascism and the memory of the resistance were depicted as uh, politically obsolete and even dangerous ideals for Italy's new republic, a country in need of a somewhat patriotic renewal. From this point of view, the Italian case bears similarities to the processes in Central and Eastern Europe, which at roughly the same time erased the previous memorial structure based on the cult of the resistance, on the role played by the communists, and built new memories that cultivated the traditions and values of the homeland. Uh, the traditional criticism of the memory of the resistance by the neo-fascists uh, described as being if uh, described the resistance as being a fratri fratricidal war, civil war, sought by the communists, quickly led to the demand for an alternative public and institutional memory. For this purpose, the right wing called for pacification between fascist and anti fascist with the aim of creating a new shared memory. A traditional demand of the far right, um, notably the idea of national pacification, was invoked with a rhetorical emphasis on the recognition of the good faith and uh, ethical patriotism of the young Italians, benevolent, benevolently called the Boys of Salò, who after 8 uh, September 1943 had taken sides with Mussolini for the defense of the nation's honor, they said. Underlying the repeated call for the construction of a shared or reconciled memory, independent from the fascist anti fascist dichotomy, was an attempt of the right to achieve parity between the parties in the name of a patriotism that did not make distinctions. Um, proof of this is found in the draft laws equating the father of Salo with the partisans. Uh, but the real goal of the right came out with the explicit proposal, also advanced in Parliament, to abolish the national holiday of 25 April, the day of liberation from fascism and of the victory of the resistance, and to replace it with a date with an anti-totalitarian significance. The date proposed was uh, 18th April 1948, the day when the Christian Democrats led by De Gasperi defeated the coalition of the communists and socialists in the Marxist-inspired Popular Front. Strongly supported by the Berlusconi governments, these measures were never passed but they represent relevant example of the intentions of the new Italian right in relation to politics of memory. Until 2009, Berlusconi himself was conspicuously absent from the official commemoration of 25 April, conducting a constant anti-communist polemic, uh, for example, by widely publicizing the Black Book of Communism, uh, the Black, as you see, the Black Book of Communism, of Communism was translated and published by the publisher Mondadori, uh, the, the biggest uh, publisher in Italy, owned by Berlusconi. Um, conducting a component, and on several occasions he, he has presented his, himself 
as a, a spokesman for a sugar-coated vision of fascism in line with a widespread popular feeling. In interview with the English newspaper The Spectator in August 2003, Berlusconi stated that, I quote, fascism was a benign dictatorship. And he, he added, Mussolini did not murder anyone. Mussolini used to send people on vacation in internal exile. Um, uh, again, in January 2013, on the occasion of the commemoration of the day of, of the Holocaust, the Remembrance Day of the Holocaust, Berlusconi mentioned Mussolini's alleged merits, saying that his only fault was to have been an improvised ally of Hitler and to have passed the Russian laws. Gianfranco Fini, <clears throat> the last secretary of the Movimento Sociale and instigator of its transformation in Alleanza, into Alleanza Nazionale, uh, in alleged post-ideological and anti-totalitarian modern liberal force, played a major role in the politics of memory promoted by the right wing. At the time, this effort carried little credibility, seeing that in an interview with an Italian newspaper in April 1994, Fini called Mussolini, I quote, the greatest statements of the century. Moreover, after introducing the category of anti-totalitarianism as a point of reference, the post-fascist right considered the German Nazi regime and the communist dictatorships to be totalitarian, but not, according to the historian Renzo Di Felice, Italian fascism. For a final reckoning with the experience of the fascist regime, it seemed enough to condemn only the most flagrant link between the dictatorship of Mussolini and Nazi totalitarianism, that is anti-Semitism and the persecution of the Jews. So it was in relation to the memory of the Holocaust that Fini, Fini's journey toward democratic legitimization began at the end of the 90s. After a visit to Auschwitz in 1999, and after the establishment of the second Berlusconi government in 2001 as deputy prime minister, he gave an interview in September 2002 to the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, in which he asked for forgiveness for the Russian laws. Finally, on his trip to Israel in November 2003, uh, he visited Yad Vashem in Jerusalem and condemned the, the uh, infamous Russell laws of 1938 enacted by fascism, calling it, calling the fascism as an absolute evil for its co-responsibility in the Holocaust. Uh, you can see the, the image of uh, Fini at the Yad Vashem. Fini's stance on the fascist anti-Semitism led to a rupture with the more intransigent wing of the party, starting with the Duce Grant's daughter, Alessandra Mussolini. At the political level, this change contributed to the democratic legitimization of the leader of Alleanza Nazionale. He was named Minister of Foreign Affairs in 2004 and President of the Chamber in April 2008. Yet at the level of public debate, this has indeed worked as a sort of purification rite of fascism. It paved the way for the dissemination of a softened image of Mussolini regimes, uh, which was uh, already widespread in, by the media during the 80s under the influence of the revisionist currents. Considering the fascist anti-Semitism as the only stain to be erased, many members of the post-movimento sociale, post-fascist, right, thought they had now, so to speak, a free hand for promoting fascism alleged historical merits from the modernization of the country to the fight against the mafia, obscuring or even denying the dimension of violence and coercion of internal opponents and other peoples invaded in the country's forays abroad. Yeah. 
it is not surprising that centre-right local administration in Italian cities promote, promoted the renaming of streets, squares, or public buildings to honour a large number of fascist figures and the martyrs of the Foibe. Italians, captured and killed by Tito's communists in the region of Venezia Giulia and Istria after the Italian armistice in September 1943, and especially after the end of the war in May 1945, when Yugoslavia had the annexionist uh, designs of what at the, at the time was Italian territory. The name Foibe comes from the name of the sinkholes where the bodies of the victims were thrown. The memory of the Foibe and the memory also of the uh, exodus of the Italian from the Adriatic regions, um, this memory with its strong anti-communist imprint has become one of the strongest icons of all the Italian right, including the League of Bossi and Salvini. In March 2004, on the proposal of Alianza Nazionale and with the support of all parties except the extreme left, the parliament approved a law that introduced a day of remembrance in the civil calendar in memory of the victims of the Foibe and of the hundreds of thousand Italians expelled from Istria and Dalmatia. They were about 300,000 and the date uh, chosen is, uh, as uh, Johanna has said, uh, the 10th of February today. <laughs> Always a key element in the memory of the war cultivated by the neo-fascist right, the martyrs of the Foibe have thus become part of the national public memory. There can be no doubt that it was important to raise awareness about these dramatic events, but it, it, uh, it is also true that it, it was done without any critical reflection. Indeed, the neo-fascist narrative of the immediate post-war period, which denounced the Foibe as the fruit of communist Yugoslav expansionism and hatred of Italy has now been revived without including any historical context. That is to say, without any reference to the 20 year oppression of the Slovenian and Croatian population by Italian fascists in the territories annexed to Italy after the First World War, or to the Italian occupation of Yugoslavia in 1941-43, which was stained by serious war crimes. The institutionalization of the Day of Remembrance for the Foibe has provided the right with a very effective channel to spread its version of the phenomenon of the Foibe, decrying it as an act of genocide committed against unarmed victims. In other words, a campaign of ethnic cleansing against Italians hunted down for no other reason than their nationality. This supported the process of equating communist violence with the German one, to the point that the rightist mass media are currently labeling the Foibe as the Italian Shoah. How did the forces traditionally link to the different culture of anti-fascism react? Three distinct attitudes can be identified. The first was a full-blown opposition. The second, a we can say a change of uh, allegiance. And the third uh, was a willingness to compromise. As a reaction to the new offensive of the right wing, an energetic movement of opposition emerged in defense of the anti-fascist foundations of Italian democracy. The defense of the memory of the resistance fueled a vigorous protest movement at the street level. The celebration of 25 April became an occasion for great popular demonstration, starting with the 1994 protest in Milan against the newly elected Berlusconi government. You can see the, the slide, the, the picture. This movement demonstrated the existence of a social memory 
of the resistance with deep and vital roots, uh, which was uh, already emerged uh, strongly in the 60s and the 70s, and which now re-emerge to face the challenge posed by the new right of Berlusconi. He actually mm, uh, was seen by many sectors of the opposition as a threat to democracy. In this sense, anti-fascism can be rightly seen as a mobilizing tool to defend the whole overall democratic system. The late 90s saw another mobilization of public opinion with the resumption, resumption of judicial proceedings against Nazi war criminals in Italy, starting with the trial of the former SS captain Erich Pripke in Rome, followed by numerous uh, trials in absentia against the men responsible for the worst massacres of Italians carried out by Nazis after September 1943. Um, yes, you, you can see the, the protest of the Jewish community because in, uh, in the occasion of the first trial against Pripke, Pripke was not condemned and then followed two other trials and at the end it was uh, condemned to life imprisonment and uh, he died in Italy in 2013. Um, he, he, he was escaped after the war in Argentina and he was, he was extradited from Argentina. I, I can remember that more than 50 German soldiers uh, have been sentenced to life imprisonment but no one has ever been extradited from Germany. The attention to the memory of the massacres promoted, uh, promoted the reintroduction of the traditional anti-fascist narrative focused on the representation of Italians as victims of Nazi fascism. This representation had favor, albeit indirectly, the assuaging of Italian guilt and the revitalization of the self-absolving image of good Italians. However, this comfortable alibi started being questioned in the second half of the 90s when a new series of studies brought some of the darkest pages of fascist Italy to the attention of public opinion, including colonial violence, the persecution of Jews, rights and lives, and the crimes committed in the territories occupied by the regime during the Second World War. Taken by the investigations of historians new analysis, in 1996, the myth of good Italian was officially rejected by the Ministry of Defense, which acknowledged the use of chemical weapons by the Italians during the Ethiopian campaign a reality instead long denied by the conservative press, despite the evidence presented by the scholars. The criticism of the stereotype of an Italian colonialism with a human face was laid by the historian and journalist Angelo Del Boca, who inspired the 2006 legislative proposal by the new Italian Communist Party to dedicate a day of remembrance for the victims of Italian colonialism. A little later, another draft law was proposed uh, by Communist Party with the aim of dedicating a day to all the victims of fascism. But the electoral defeat of the radical left in 2008 elections put an end to the plan. Efforts made in defense of the anti-fascist public memory and the attempts to reinforce it have managed to contain the anti-fascist crisis, but have not reversed it, failing to construct a regenerating reading of the resistance paradigm. This process was also made evident by numerous migrations, not only by politicians, intellectuals and journalists of the whole Partito Socialista, Socialist Pass Party of Scraxi, but also by the former members of the um, Communist Party and extra parliamentary left wingers who ended up on the right wing side of the political spectrum, 
especially in Forza Italia, where they played an active role in the revisionist battle on memory. The famous left-leaning journalist Gian Paolo Panza was, without any doubt, a protagonist of this battle. This is not uh, okay. Um, he, he did not choose to be political tied to the right, but with his books, which sold hundreds of thousands of copies, he was one of the main architects of the controversy against the resistance, which was conducted in an increasingly acrimonious atmosphere. Uh, alongside the two opposite poles of opposition and betrayal, the tendency to revise the anti-fascist memory has also appeared on the left in the form of a willingness to compromise. Support for an agreement with the right was manifested above all in the former Communist Party, which first became the Democratic Party of the left, then the Democrats of the left, and finally merged with the Catholics of La Margherita to form the Democratic Party in 2007. With this transition, the post-communist leadership was particularly responsive to the invitation issued by the right wing with regard to the construction of a shared memory. In this dialogue, the Alianza Nazionale was the privileged point of contact. Each side sought recognition of its legitimacy from the other in order to cement the new bipolar political structure born in the 90s in which these two parties took center stage after being excluded from government under the First Republic. One of the leading promoters of the move to reconcile the opposing memories was the former magistrate and member of parliament for the Partito Democratico e la Sinistra, Luciano Violante, who as president of the Chamber of Deputies engaged in a close dialogue with Gianfranco Fini on the subjects of the Foibe and the Boys of Salò. The compromise between the two political leaders was cemented on the controversial memory of the Foibe, as evidenced by the mm, Democratici della Sinistra support for the establishment of the Day of Remembrance in 2004, and the decision of many left-wing municipalities to name streets and squares after the martyrs of the Foibe. Rather than proposing its critical version of this memory, the left has accepted the strong nationalist version favored by the right wing, describing the Italians uh, of the Foibe as sorry as innocent victims of a, an ethnic cleansing and thus absolving the fascist regime of its guilt. The search for a political compromise also underpinned the legislation of July 2000, which introduced the Day of Remembrance in memory of the Holocaust on uh, two, um, 27th January. This is the most important of the commemorations recently established in the country. Promoted by the left to remember, I quote, the Italian persecution of Jewish citizens, and other victims of deportations, the law never uses the word fascism. Among its purpose, it includes the recognition of the hate given to the Jews by the Italians of all political ideas. The commemoration of those who helped the victims of persecution was also one of the aims of the declaration of the 2000 Stockholm International Forum on the Holocaust, in Italy, however, the commemoration has had significant consequences. Among the many tributes held since January 21, 2001, sorry, dedicated to the memory of the Jews persecuted by the Nazis and the fascists, and of the deportation of Italian military and politicians to German concentration camps, there is a clear tendency, especially on the right, to favor the celebration of the hacks of solidarity and hate made by Italians. One figure highlighted in particular was Giorgio Perlasca. We have the slide of Giorgio Perlasca, yeah. A former fascist volunteer in the Spanish Civil War, 
who claimed to be the Spanish consul in Budapest in 1944 and managed to save thousands of people, thousands of Jews. For this act, he was awarded uh, the right to use a the nation honor. The recognition of Perlasca and other saviors of Jews has thus revived the image of the good Italians among public opinion. Um, in the, in the slide, the following slide, you see a, a image of a television movie on Perlasca, Perlasca, un eroe italiano, Perlasca, an Italian hero. Uh, that was inter Perlasca was interpreted by this actor. This actor is uh, Zingare uh, Zingaretti. Is one of the most famous actors in Italy, and millions of Italians saw the, the, the movie on TV. The danger of this policy is that it provides a comfortable smoke screen behind which the national conscience can hide and thus avoid coming, terms, coming to terms with the country's involvement in the persecution of the Jews. Um, almost, I, I, know, I want to notice that almost half of the Jews arrested in Italy and sent to Auschwitz were taken by Italian policemen, not by the Germans. In the Italian war of memory, with all its battle, its uh, ceasefires and its compromises, a crucial role was played by the presidents of the Republic. Oscar Luigi Scalfaro in the, in the 90s, then uh, Carlo Azzeglio Ciampi, uh, Giorgio Napolitano, and lastly, Sergio Mattarella. Here you see the Calazzaglio Ciampi. Um, Ciampi and Napolitano in particular chose memory as a privileged area of intervention to hold together a country which had long been divided by the bitter political crash, clash between centre-right and centre-left under Berlusconi and whose national cohesion was under threat from the separatist Northern Liga of Bossi. Both Ciampi and Napolitano sought to construct an all-encompassing memory, which included new elements that were not part of the earlier anti-fascist narrative, such as the memory of the Foibe, the victims of a light bombing on, of Italian cities, and the rapes committed in Italy by the French expeditionary force. Uh, but above all, they revived and defended the memory of the resistance by protecting and defending it against the revisionist campaign. Thanks to the presidency of the Republic, the demand that the boys of Salo should be placed on the same footing as the partisans has been rejected. The same happened with the proposal to abolish 25 April as a national holiday. Champion Napolitano placed place the recognition of the resistance at the center of the institutional memory, interpreting it in a neo-patriotic fashion and as a struggle for national liberation resulting from the union between people and the army. Both presidents limited the explicit references to the anti-fascism and supported the idea of the resistance for the armed forces who remained loyal to the king and stood up to the Germans. It is no co co coincidence that the Greek island of Kefalonia, Cephalonia, the scene of the Wehrmacht's worst massacres of Italian soldiers in 1943, has become a key site of memory. Now you see the visit of Champ in Cefalone in 2001. The presidents of the Republic have underlined the bond that the una, units, the Risorgimento, the birth of the national state in the 19th century to the First World War and to the resistance, which is traditionally described as the Second Risorgimento. And they have consistently stressed the European significance of the resistance identifying the foundation of today's United Europe in the struggle against Nazism and fascism waged by Italy and the other population of the continent. From this European perspective, we should also underline President Napolitano's attempt since 2010 to transform the memory, uh, the foibe, the memory of foibe, 
from a na nationalist memory into a memory of European reconciliation between Italy, Slovenia and Croatia, based on the mutual recognition of wrongs that the parties have historically inflicted each other on each other and on the a fruitful future collaboration inside the European Union. In uh, this regard, we, we can also recall that the, the, the visit that President Sergio Mattarella and the Slovenian President Borut Pahor uh, made, made uh, in 2020 uh, to the first uh, to the national monuments of the Foyba in Bas Basovica and then nearby the, to the monument that commemorates the killing of some Slovenian young people sentenced to death by the fascist regime. The image of that you see the, that you are seeing the image of the two presidents holding hands in hands was very powerful. This policy has helped to avert a potentially dangerous political confrontation between Italy and its eastern neighbors, marked over the years by diplomatic crime. Now you see, see the, the, the visit in uh, Trieste 2020. Okay. Um, mm, uh, yes, this policy. Mark, uh, this policy has helped to avert a potentially dangerous political confrontation between Italy and its eastern neighbors, marked over the years by diplomatic crisis and by the neo irredentist position of the Italian right. Italian nationalists were keen to redefine the territorial agreements signed by Italy and Yugoslavia in 1975 claiming that the dissolution of the Yugoslav Federation rendered them invalid. Um, even the presidents of the German Republic's numerous visit made in Italy in this, to the site of the Nazi massacres were a clear sign of a process of bilateral uh, reconciliation in the name of their common European membership. Uh, here you see the, the, the image of uh, the, the visit of uh, President Joachim Gauck, German President jo Joachim Gauck, to Santana Statsema. Santana Statsema is uh, a, a site, uh, the site of a, a brutal massacre committed by Germans in Toscana, Santana Stazema in the, is in Toscana, and there were almost 400 civilians killed in this massacre. In other words, Italy since the 90s represent a particularly interesting case with reference to the changes in public narratives and cultural memory. The new coordinates of European memory promoted by the European institution in Brussels, the memory of the Shoah and the anti-totalitarian paradigm, have gained considerable ground inside the Italian public opinion. The memory of the resistance, bedrock of the First Republic, came under great pressure from two sides, competition from the Shoah on the one hand and the antagonistic memory of the Foibe on the other. But thanks to the steadfastness of the country's presidents, the memory of the resistance has not been undermined or replaced and has remained a fundamental pillar in the national institutional memory. Coming to the conclusion, also in Italy as in Europe, there is an, an antagonism between different culture of memory with a tendency, a tendency to a polarization on the one hand, a memory with a strong nationalist imprinting centered on the memory of the Foibe declined in terms of recriminatory self-victimization and ideological anti-communism. On the other hand, a culture of memory based on the main pillars of the resistance and the Shoah that defends the universal value of human rights. However, the latter two shows an important limit. It is marked by the persistence of the self-absolving image of the good Italian. It is still only touched by the attempt to start a critical reworking on the fascist past. 
dealing with the issue of a reckoning with the faults of Italian fascism, its crime inside and outside the country, both in Africa and in Europe. The country, Italy, that gave birth to fascist totalitarianism, continues to postpone its showdown with the legacy of its dark past. Uh, in the Italian European political context, this is all the more urgent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Filippo. Thank you for this very interesting, inspiring lecture. And now I think we can go over to the questions and I give the floor to Greg. <laughs> Greg, please. Uh, thank you indeed, uh, uh, Professor Focardi, for your truly insightful, uh, like um, epic uh, mm, uh, insight on uh, uses and abuses of the past in actually justifying the present. Uh, I find your contribution truly like an um, excellent empirical illustration of uh, how skillfully policymakers uh, refer to the past actually to construct the indeed uh, strategies of legitimizing very specific uh, policy making. And I believe uh, your contribution sounds very, I would say, analogous to the Central European, specifically Polish, mnemonic warfare uh, see, uh, discussion about selectiveness, selective memory, uh, selectiveness in actually choosing you know, certain elements which fit which feeds certain, um, uh, certain anticipated vision of uh, the greatness of the nation. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, for that purpose, uh, as a kind of uh, um, downgrading uh, the black, uh, the black uh, pages in the national history. Very well. Now, let me open the discussion. Uh, I'm sure, yes, uh, uh, our colleagues will have uh, some some questions to uh, Professor Focardi. So please, now the floor is yours. Questions, uh, discussion. Yes, please. Any question, please, to Professor Focardi and and his and his contribution. We know that, uh, as we say in radio, uh, silence is killing radio. <laughs> that, that is why, yes, uh, we need to, yes, we need to kind of perhaps spice up uh, this discussion. So, yes, maybe let me start with my humble, actually, question to you. Uh, Professor Focardi, do you see Italian case of this selectiveness, uh, selective uh, memory and kind of patchwork as yes, approach to national memory traumas Simply saying, do you believe that the Italian case of this contested legacy fits certain model, more general picture of other yes, stories from from Europe, like Spain, Spain, for instance? What is your view? Um, is Italy's case specific, or perhaps, in terms of this mnemonic warfare syndrome, or perhaps yes, you may find some similarities with other cases, like mm -hmm. Spain, for instance, please. Oh, thank you for your reflections and for your question. Um, what uh, is very interesting for me and what I think is the some a sort of similarities uh, between the Italian case and the case of the other country of the of Central Eastern Europe. Uh, in, in Italy, after the watershed of two, 1989, uh, we see this process of really regionalization um, of the uh, fascist right, uh, no, posing on the same step, the young fascist soldier who, the, who fight, fought with Mussolini and the partisans. Uh, we, have, we have had a monument in Italy dedicated to Maresciallo Graziani, 
with, who was the, the commander in chief of the fascist forces of the Republic of Salo, uh, is a process of uh, to um, that I, for me, as um, similarities uh, with with what with with uh, what we can see uh, in uh, countries like. Um, your Poland or uh, Hungary, uh, some figures like uh, Marischal Horthy uh, or, the, um, or um, in Croatia, um, other other case of the Ustasha, the Ustasha case, no, that uh, in, in through the through the um, a patriotic memory has been re-legitimized. Mm -hmm. yes, of yes. course, we, we can, we can I, I don't, the, the, there is a European discourse, of course, that you, you mentioned uh, the Spain, no? Mm, I, I, and I think that also the memory, the, Policy of memory, the cultural memory in Spain is uh, in deep transformation. The presence of the of uh, um, conservative party, populist conservative party in in all our countries are are putting are uh, a, are a sort of uh, how do you say a sfida, a, a challenge for the for the um, for the memories i i, I think this uh, this um, antagonism between uh, uh, cosmopolitan memories was who is based on the defense of the values of the um, the, the universal values of the um, uh, human rights and on the one hand on on the other the 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 claim claiming of the national uh, uh, values is a a, a phenomenon a, in a European phenomenon. So in, in this in, in in this sense we have uh, a, a similarities. <laughs> Italy is in in Europe and Europe is facing this problem mm -hmm. this uh, this struggle. Yes, I don't know if I am. Yes, well, thank you indeed. Yes, uh, um, it's very much like a relevant observation, um, indeed. Uh, uh, I like your point. You see, Professor Fakadi, about uh, this polarizing, polarizing um, effect of uh, mnemonic warfare, meaning uh, and now and your and your analogy with Poland. Actually, Poland is an excellent case of this selective mnemonic. Uh, approach uh, to the past in justifying certain vision of nation building here and now. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, I believe that it's kind of tempting, Joanna, perhaps, to think about the paper um, comparing actually this, this Polish and Italian mnemonic warfare strategies uh, using and abusing of the past uh, in nation building actually. So it's, yes. yes. For, for example, the, the theme of the, um, the, the the Italians of the Pol Poland as the savior of the Jews. No, In the, yes. I think this is also another point, uh, common point. Mm -hmm. In the removing the responsibility in the persecution yes, of the yes. Jews and highlighting the the merits. That, that were real, eh? not 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 invented, but uh, the real merit. But it served to it's a selective selective memory, as you say. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so once again, indeed, thank you. By all means, I wouldn't like to monopolize the floor. So please, now, yes, take this opportunity to ask uh, uh, Filippo your your questions, please, o observations, please. If I may. Um... Yes, because I'd like to come back to my first question uh, regarding to national holidays in Italy, the problem with uh, the celebration of the 25th April by uh, some political forces, uh, right wing forces. Uh, and on the other hand, 
the attempt to promote new uh, national holidays like uh, Remembrance Day, Liberation Day, Freedom Day, Freedom Day. Um, and I'm wondering if it's a kind of uh, a new uh, national holidays uh, the war <laughs> because uh, we are dealing with uh, memory wars and uh, this uh, problem with uh, national holidays uh, could be a part of this memory war yes yes i mean in Italy, we have had a um, lot of transformations in the civil calendar in the last 20 years. The, 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 may, the most important uh, new dates are the, the dates that we have uh, mentioned, the day of, for Holocaust and the day for the Foibe, but we have had many others. Uh, a day for the victim of terrorism, a day for the victims of mafia, we have a day, uh, a remembrance date for um, the, the, how do you, uh, the day of uh, um, liberty dedicated to the fall of uh, Berlin, uh, Berlin Wall. Um, and, and many, 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 uh, many, many new remembrance day, day. And also in this field, we can observe a struggle between a, a nationalist point of view and a liberal democrat, I don't know how to, we can <laughs> define it, point of view. Uh, for example, last year was introduced in Italy a day dedicated to uh, Alpini. Alpini is a uh, how do you say a speciality of the Italian army, the troops that fight in the mountains, and there is a myth of the Alpini in Italy, uh, but it was uh, chosen as date for celebrating this uh, military corps, uh, the 26th January, uh, referring to a struggle uh, in in uh, Russia in 2042, um, the Alpini was in Russia mm, as uh, fascist troops, no, and so we and they 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 they, they fought with uh, uh, heroism, of course, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But it was no one uh, noticed that these this battle was a battle of a fascist army. And we commemorate now a, a, the heroism of fascist troops. It, it was passed because it was, it was a ref, referred to the national si significance of this uh, uh, battle. Um, so we and I know I have heard some days ago that the new government in Italy want to introduce a new remembrance day uh, for the homeland, the day of the homeland, il giorno della patria. So we, 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 you, you are perfectly right. We we can we we are uh, we assist. We we see a a memory wars, a memory struggle also on in uh, in the field of the new civil calendar in the in the new uh, remembrance days. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Very well, very well. Please, uh, any other comments, questions? Uh, perhaps the last round of questions, observations. Julio, yes. Professor Julio Ponce, please. Previously this morning, and I, and, and I couldn't um, uh, attend all the all the all the speeches. 
But <clears throat> what I heard is is very interesting, and and I just thank to Professor Filippo Focardi for for his lecture today. I I wonder after <clears throat> what we have been talking um, this morning, how is it possible to build up or to make a memory of you? Uh, uh, the memory of school, I have never had. Uh, memory of Europe. I, of Europe, uh, yeah. Or an European memory. At, at a certain point, it seems that it's uh, such an, an impossible, um, an impossible uh, work to do, because this is 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 um, there are different memories, different stories, civil wars and wars against another neighbors, which is which is the difference. But on the other hand, I see that the um, memory in the different countries has some similarities in terms of politicization, in terms of uh, polarization. Is always uh, in Poland or in Italy, in Spain, or even Portugal. Uh, the, que the question of the memory is surrounded by controversials, uh topics and so on so <clears throat> um even what 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 you have been uh, talking about perlaska perlaska was used uh, and, uh, as, as a smoke screen in italy but uh perlaska was seen in spain and perlaska was used uh, uh, also as a smoke screen in this case not only talking about perlaska but talking about the uh, ambassador the spanish ambassador um, uh, San Angel Sanz Brief, eh, who was very famous to save uh, Jews. No, so mm, uh, my 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 question is up to: Can we reach uh, a certain level of of uh, European memory, or or not? It's an open question. It's just a, a reflection. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this important and difficult question <laughs> to answer. And I see that the, the, the politics are trying to, to elaborate, construct, and impose the uh, a, a European memory. So we, we have a, a sort of push by the politics at the um, European level, the European institution uh, are doing uh, too much maybe <laughs> to, to create this memory. All of us knows the, the, the resolution of, uh, of September 1919, uh, 2019 of the European Parliament on the importance of the memory for the future of Europe. And so we, in, on one hand, I see these efforts, intensive effort of the politics for to construct a, a European memory, uh, but for in it, but maybe this is the problem <laughs> because it creates lots of lots of problem. And on the other end, we we can observe as uh, um, uh, that maybe it's it should be uh, important starting not from a politics of memory, but uh, the, from the history. I, maybe you know this important document by Marcus Pruch, no? it, it was a, he, he worked with the, the Cultural Commission of the European uh, Parliament, and he wrote almost 10 years ago this uh, report, very, very interesting, on the politics of memory of the Union, European Union. And he, he, he noticed all the, the limits of these uh, politics of memory from above. You know, this myth of the, um, uh, these two pillars, the Shoah and the anti-totalitarianism, anti-totalitarian paradigm, were very um, a sort of they represent a sort of alibi for all the European countries because the sh the responsible of for Shoahs are the Germans, mainly the Germans. The responsible of the crimes of communism are the Russians. So 
we can stay safe and in our with our past it is not and there are also in in this construction in this architecture uh, lots of uh, uh, limits uh, for example uh, the, the the colonialism the uh, no and the, the the roots of nationalisms that uh, stay not uh, in the second world war but uh, in the 18th century and so on and he he proposed to in uh, to invest um, money <laughs> in the in the history in the formation of the um professor of history not in this uh, politics of memory so maybe it's, it should be very important that we we, we in, the, in our we uh, italians uh, or all the europeans french and uh, we can uh, study in uh, our schools uh, more and more on the past of the other countries this is very important. May, I don't know. This is a, maybe it should be the first step. Then the memories can. It's it's another. <laughs> I, so it's not easy to 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 respond. But uh, I can I I I can say this for the moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you indeed, uh, Julio, for your last. In concluding intervention, which is a perfect conclusion, you see, of our seminar today, which brings me to the point that actually it is up to us. It is, uh, I believe this is our responsibility as scholars. Uh, we are supposed to know more than yes, and therefore, and, and yes, and therefore, you know, kind of uh, transform this, this uh, selective mnemonic nation building stories into human stories human stories, yes, a uh, European uh, perspective uh, is a human perspective, after all. So, uh, so yes, uh, I think that's the way we could we could possibly follow in our own daily business as, as, as uh, members of academia. Very well. Uh, I believe I've got the impression that we come to the conclusion of our seminar today. So once again, indeed, uh, thank you, Professor Focardi, for your truly Epic, uh, yes, uh, insight on the mnemonic warfare in Italian case. Uh, thank you very much indeed for um, all of you for your contributions, questions, and observations. And now I would pass over to um, Joanna to formally close our session today, please. Joanna. Thank you, Gregor. Uh, thank you uh, for joining our uh, today's lecture, uh, especially thanks to Filippo for very interesting extremely interesting uh, seminar. Uh, thank you uh, to Julio uh, for his important uh, reflection uh, of questions. And um, I think it's all for today. And thank you once again and see you in March. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very thank much. You. Ciao. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye. 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 Bye.